So let's get rolling with tonight's webinar. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Eric Elliott, and I'm the Advanced Hunter Education Coordinator with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm going to introduce our topic and presenter tonight. And so as you're preparing for any hunt, there's so much to think about and so much preparation and packing that needs to be done. It's kind of like, yep, I've got my bow dialed in. The horses are in shape. Am I in good shape? Well, maybe not. Maybe we could talk about that after the holidays. Got a fresh battery in your rangefinder? Check. Knife? Check. Game bags? Yep. You don't want to forget anything. There's so much critical gear that you need, and if you leave some of it behind, you're going to be sidelined. Tonight, we're going to be talking about gear that is absolutely critical to have in your pack, as critical as your spotting scope and ammunition. Tonight, we're going to have a roundtable discussion regarding how to build a hunting medical kit. So I'm thankful to have two friends with me tonight. Both are certified hunter education instructors for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Our first panelist is Rick Travis. He currently works for the California Rifle and Pistol Association. He's taught basic, intermediate, and advanced wilderness medicine and instructed wilderness EMT courses. He's worked in wilderness medicine for 20 years. He also told me on our briefing that he's delivered lots of babies as a medic. So pregnant moms, if you get a craving to go out buck hunting in the wilderness in your last trimester, he's a good guy to have on the mountain with you. Our second panelist is Mike Pettingle. Mike is the owner and an instructor at the Personal Protection Academy in Southern California. Mike's a wilderness and remote first aid instructor through the American Red Cross. And it's also a certified stop the bleed instructor. My favorite part of your resume, Mike, is that you were a US Army paratrooper and medic. So Mike's had some experience with knowing how to build and use a quality medical kit. And if I could just speak personally, as a dad of a son who just graduated Army boot camp, I have a lot of respect for your military service. Thanks for your service, brother. So Mike and Rick, thanks for being with us tonight. The floor is yours, take it away. Hey guys, so uh, guys and gals, welcome to uh, our webinar. So uh, we want, what we wanna do is really take the opportunity to talk to you about that, that vital uh, piece of your kit. Um, and, and this is where, um, you know, when you're when you're packing, whether it's a, a couple hours uh, 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 just going out for a hunt or you're going overnight or you're going for a couple days, man, weight is important, right? You've got to think about every ounce <clears throat> you, and you're really looking at um, uh, value versus versus ounces when it comes to your your hunting gear. Well, um, the same is true when it comes to your med kit and, and the med kit. I'd hate to say that the, the reality is, is that your med kit is probably more important than your bow or your or your rifle or or whatever you're using to, to uh, harvest game. But um, what you've got to do is you've got to plan for the worst. You've got to be able to 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 prepare and, and, and be ready for the worst. Um, we want to go into first kind of an overview of three different types of kits, a small kit, a medium kit, and a large kit. Now we just talked about weight versus value. It's not really that it's not, well, gee, I only got room for a pound or a pound and a half of med gear. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to put the small kit in today. That's not what we're really looking at as far as the, the size of the kit. It's really the duration of your stay and the distance you are from professional help. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to um, talk about, uh, really show three different slides, uh, talking about the contents of a small, a medium, and a large kit. And um, then I'm going to ask Rick to, to make sure that he's uh, uh, he's got some ideas on this. 
And then what uh, Rick and I are going to do is we're going to share some of the things that we feel are kind of the top three must haves in your kit, kind of no matter what the size is. So uh, let me uh, let me share my screen here and we'll get into um, we'll get into a couple of uh, PowerPoint slides that talk to us about um, the contents of our kit. So your small kit is going to be something where <clears throat> really your your 10 minutes or you're just a few minutes away from EMS because the reality is 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 um, I, I don't want to be the one that's going to be taking care of myself or somebody else. And I, I want to turn things over to people who are who are um, better qualified than me. Um, so this would be a good time if you've got a screen grab feature or if you've got a phone and you just want to hold it up here, take a take a photo of the contents here. And this is what you're looking at for a small kit. You'll want to take a couple more photos as we go through this. So just real quickly, in a small kit, you're looking at the things that are going to be comfort and they're going to be life-saving. And um, we can argue about things like Benadryl. Is that comfort or is that life-saving when it comes to, to um, uh, 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 staving off um, bites and so forth, Benadryl may fall into the life-saving category. Um, but we're looking at, uh, we have to classify it somehow, right? The things that we want to make sure that are in our life-saving category is we're looking at surgical sponges. We're looking at quick clot, which is a, which is a, a coagulant. Uh, you may recognize that from uh, World War II movies, Band of Brothers and and Saving Private Ryan. That's the white powder that they they sprinkle on you, but it's it's kind of um, not really chemically different. It's it's been structured differently now. And what they do is opposed to putting it directly on the wounds. Oftentimes you'll see it in gauze sponges, and uh, you put it directly on the wound and you. Uh, you uh, cinch it down, you, you tighten it down close to the body, and it's going to help chemically um, uh, slow down the bleeding. You want to look at tourniquets and you want to look at oral rehydration salts. And um, those are some of the big life-saving things that, that you're looking to sustain life. This is for yourself. This is for uh, those you're hunting with or maybe those you come across. Um, then let's go into our, our next slide, which is going to be the medium kit. Let me back up just a touch and show you <clears throat> show you my small kit. You may have heard of heard of this as, a, as an IFAC or an uh, individual first aid kit. Um, this is going to be about the size, if you compare it to my big old head, uh, this is about the size of something that you're looking at for a, a, a small kit. Something that's going to sustain you when you're about uh, uh, 10 minutes away. Uh, from from EMS. Uh, now we're looking at a medium kit, and this is going to be something a little bit larger. This is really what I carry. It's it, it it lives in my hunting backpack, and this is what I'm going to have uh, at a minimum uh, on on myself when I when I'm uh, uh, out hunting. And the the size and the weight um, increases, but you're really looking at. Uh, what is going to sustain life when you're an hour or so away from EMS? So when I'm uh, my my most frequent hunting is going to be uh, deer and turkey, and it's going to usually uh, more more often than not, it's a it's an hour drive from my home, and uh, probably at least forty five minutes away from from anything that that can help me sustain life. So what I'm looking to do is what is going to be most important to get me 45 or an hour and a half away from where I am right now. And the things that you're looking at here is you're looking at um, four by four surgical sponges. So larger sponges now, and now you're, you're able to not only um, apply pressure um, with these sponges, you're able to pack with them, then you're able to do a few other things. Um, an H or an, an emergency bandage, an Israeli bandage, this is going to be to um, add pressure. So if you have uh, really going to be most useful when you have uh, multiple um, locations of bleeding. And um, this is when you can apply the H bandage uh, and then walk away from that site, go to another site on the body. 
then you're also looking at quick clot again. Uh, this is going to be something that you're going to want to keep um, keep uh, uh, for your uh, uh, to apply to those bleeders and make sure that you're uh, giving you the best chance to stop that bleeding. One of the key points of this is to look at is it's very easy um, for uh, a typical person to bleed out inside of a minute uh, to to lose all the blood they need to to expire uh, right then and there. My uh, I have a I have a um, because I've I've done a lot of uh, long distance running and endurance events. I've got a pretty low resting heart rate, a pretty high, um, uh, a powerful, strong heart. My wife, who's a nurse, the the inside the the, the Pettengill home joke is that is that well, yeah, Mike, you've got that big strong heart. It just means you're going to bleed out faster. You need to keep me closer. And that's the kind of dark humor we get in the household here. So um, uh, thanks to my wife for that. I appreciate that. Um, you're also looking at uh, medium-sized burn dressing. You're looking at a pocket mask or uh, a new mask for CPR. Um, you're looking again at tourniquets, oral rehydration salts, and trauma shears. And um, one thing, just a, just a two-cent um, piece on trauma shears is please do consider those things as um, as disposable um, and one-use items. They're cheap. And if you need to cut through someone's bleeding jeans, um, you don't need to uh, keep that in your pack. You can get rid of these suckers and and uh, and get some new ones. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks that have said, oh, I just, I, I, I used it and then I threw it in my dishwasher and put it back in my pack. And, and I think that's fine. Uh, well, good. That's, I don't want to go hunting with you. Um, and just in case you got to use them on me, but uh, think of those as disposable. Um, then you have a lot of comfort items over here. Um, you, you, one of the things I want to take opportunity to, to talk about in the in the comfort items, you see a lot of things like tweezers and moleskin and band-aids, alcohol prep. Um, th that's important. That's all very important stuff. But you consider that that's not life threatening. Right. And, and if you've got <clears throat> if you say, hey, I've got my first aid kit, I am set. I don't even really know why I'm here in this webinar. And your first aid kit looks something like this. You got this on uh, Amazon for uh, $19.99. Uh, I'm not going to say throw it away, um, but please don't consider this a trauma kit. Uh, uh, this is called uh, a boo-boo kit, uh, and this is chock full of comfort items. Serves its purpose, but this is not this is not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about you stopping that bleeding, sustaining that life, and, and this is going to be comfort. This is going to be uh, something that is going to... Um, um, make you feel just a little bit better. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about sustaining life. So let's go to our third um, and final uh, type of, of kit. We're talking about a large kit. And when we're talking about a large kit, uh, this is my large kit and it's actually kind of small for a large kit. Uh, my wife's large kit is actually a backpack. Um, and this is what you're looking when you're a, when you're a day away uh, from assistance and you're a day away from EMS. And, and the things that you're gonna need here uh, are going to uh, be a, a lot more important. So you see the comfort items, you see the Benadryl and the baby aspirin, and you see, um, uh, again, the moleskin and the tweezers, and you see um, uh, poison IV toxins, all super important. Uh, uh, 10 pairs of, of gloves, um, you see, um, uh, adhering self-adhering bandages and the, the triangle bandages. Um, take a look at things like the triangle bandages here as important for multi-use items, things that you can really uh, do a lot of different stuff with, right? Um, that's going to be a, a space saving um, and it's going to be uh, something that's going to really uh, be important. Um, the the SAM splint, take a look at that. It's in the comfort item uh, area. We're going to talk, I think, a little bit more about those um, as we as we move on. But those are uh, really strong items to have in your kits. Um, and then we go into the life saving items that are in your large kit. Um, and we're looking at a lot of the same stuff. Um, you're looking at. Um, you're looking at trauma pads and trauma shears, emergency blankets. You're looking at steri strips. We'll talk more about those later. Tourniquets, uh, vented chest seals, um, and we'll talk more about that in a second as well. Um, and then you're looking at a lot of the same stuff. You're looking now as you increase the volume of some of that, 
um, more of those items and larger versions of those items. So um, that's what we wanted to show you is those three different concepts. Um, Rick, give us a couple of comments on some of those things that we talked about. Let me know if you want to go back and forth between any of those slides. And, and uh, what do you think about uh, some of those things? Rick, hit your, uh, make sure you hit your mute button for us. Um, on the large kit, Mike, I think there's a couple of things that you have to consider with any of these kits. These kits evolve the more the things that you do with them, as you know, and it also evolves based on where you're going in the time of the year. So, you know, during the, the time of the year we're at right now, I would say, along with those four ice packs, four hot packs, those instant heat packs can be invaluable if you're trying to save someone's life. Um, who's got into hypothermia, you can place those, you know, under the armpits, behind the neck and stuff and try to get them warmed up fairly quick. I also would say that with any of these kits, you need to spend time actually taking them out. Um, you know, you can put 10 medics in a room, they're highly trained and their kits are laid out 10 different ways because everybody gets becomes familiar with the way they want their kit laid out. And I think that's something that you have to do. And one of the reasons I know when we were prepping this with each other, um, we were talking about this, that when you go to work on somebody, you have to exude confidence. And if in the first moments you open this medic kit and you don't exude confidence because you don't know where things are at, um, that's not good for your patient or patients. Uh, Sam splints, I know is in this one. I tend to also carry in the small and medium size one, at least a finger or wrist sized Sam splint because uh, you know, especially the 18 and nine inch ones, they're, they're lightweight, but there's a multitude of things you can handle with those from sprains to fractures um, that can help somebody get through it and definitely protect them. One of the things that I add to all of my kits is uh, in the United States, we have very small Boy Scout bandanas, but when you go to like the UK and stuff, they have bandanas that are basically 49 and a half inches along the seam. Those become very, very good. They're a little bit bigger than triangular bandages, but there's multiple uses. You can use those to stuff into a wound. You can pack them. You can use them for uh, splints. You can use it for tying together a couple of different poles so you can build a, an emergency litter to get somebody out. Um, there's lots of uses for that. I'm a big fan of the Steri strips because um, Mike's been very good to focus on you know, life-saving things, but steri strips are also for those moments where someone's got a really bad gash. It's very easy to pull that gash together before you wrap it up and uh, prevent it from getting infected. Because, you know, if you're three days into the wilderness, that's three days out in the wilderness and three days of a wound being open, bad things can happen. And then uh, the other thing would be, um, I always, along with water, with all these kits, I always have an extra bottle of water for people. I also bring a, I know a lot of people are fans of life straws and they're great, but I'm a huge fan of a steri pen. You get it, it uses UV light and it literally, including poisons, it's able to neutralize those things. And so it allows you to take water in the local area and get you through a really tough situation. Awesome. Talk, uh, talk about the, talk about that pin real quick, uh, Rick, I, a lot of people may not be familiar with it and how easy it is to use and, and um, how you can just how pretty quickly you can, you can take a uh, 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 pretty nasty water and turn yeah, it. Yeah, you take your nasty water, you uh, filter out the big stuff, which you can use your bandana as an example for that. And then once that water's in there, you put the steri pen in and you click it and it takes about 60 to 90 seconds and it will take a two liter Nalgene bottle and make it potable water that you can drink. And that's the advantage to it. It makes it also potable water you can use for wound cleaning if you have to. So um, it eliminates a lot of the issues people have on the field with water. It just gives you a feeling of safe. One steri pen on its batteries or on the charge does, I think, right in the neighborhood of like 300 bottles, but you have to put, you know, new batteries in it. So it's, it's, I don't leave home without it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, Mike, I was going to ask you about the weight of the, your large kit estimate the weight of it is it practical for like backpacking like overnight backpack hunting um let's uh let's do this let me uh go off the share so we can get my big fat head up here 
Okay, so this is uh, size wise, um, you see it's a it's a pretty big piece, but um, it would it would definitely take up a lot of room in a day yeah. pack, right? You're probably looking at uh, eight pounds. Yeah. Right? So uh, as far as uh, having what you need, you you you're probably looking at about eight pounds. And this is like I said, this is kind of small for a large pack. Um, my wife's, my wife's is a full, is a full day pack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were going to be doing like a five day backpack hunt. Um, what would you recommend for something like that? Like just taking the, the main stuff out of that, that large kit. What do you suggest? Say that one more time. Like, if we're looking I, for what, what duration, like a five day, three to five day backpack hunt. Go ahead, Rick. I was going to say one of the things a lot of people do, and I think it's a mistake having seen it doing search and rescue is people will take that eight pound pack and they will divide it. Mm. And Murphy's law of wilderness medicine is that's a dumb thing to do because what happens is the things I need to save Eric's life were in Eric's pack that just went off the side of the cliff. And I'm left with things that are okay, but it's not going to cut it. Yeah, Mike um, Mike gets lost, Eric gets hurt, Rick's right. helping Eric, and guess what stuff Rick needs, the stuff right. that we got lost with. Good point. So I yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh I really wouldn't strip down the packs. I would I would figure out ways to endure the endure the weight. Yeah. Got it. So let me go so just kind of let me go over um uh, a couple things uh, we mentioned them, but I want to go a little further into to my my top three items uh, that I think are you've got to have. And and for me as a I'm a uh, I spend most of my time as a firearms instructor. Um, those things are with me. These things are with me at all times. And uh, as a firearms instructor, I, I'm dealing with a, a lot of folks that are new to firearms, uh, a lot less safe with firearms. Um, then hopefully our hunters and instructors are. Um, but you're looking at a lot of the same stuff because if we're talking bows, shotgun, rifles, uh, pistols, uh, we're looking at a lot of the same need. Uh, so my my top three items of, of things you got to love, you got to have are going to be tourniquets. And notice there's an S on the end of that, uh, that you're going to have multiple tourniquets. Rule of thumb on your tourniquet is uh, you have your entry wound here. You're going to go a minimum of two inches um, uh, closer to the heart, but not on a joint. Um, kind of the the, the direction, uh, and I think kind of led by the DOD right now, the direction where tourniquet placement is going is just uh, go high and tight. So if I have my wound here on my forearm, there's no reason that you can't put your tourniquet here on the uh, up, up close to the armpit. One of the interesting things that came uh, out of uh, Afghanistan and Iraq was um, that our, our boys and girls over there, uh, they were all, all issued tourniquets. And the old school, um, Rick will remember this, and Eric, you'll remember this from, from old school first aid. They just basically, I'll, 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 I'll dumb it down. They, they basically said, um, none of you guys getting first aid are, are really qualified to deal with tourniquets. So it, it's kind of high level stuff. We're just not going to have you do it. The thought process was if you apply a tourniquet, um, you're depriving this whole arm of um, oxygenated blood. And so what we're going to have is instead of a, a an entry wound here that we're dealing with, we're dealing with an entire arm we're going to have to amputate. And so it was just, we, none of us are smart enough to deal with tourniquets. So we're just not going to teach you that. Well, the, our boys and girls in Afghanistan and, and Iraq were, were all issued tourniquets and you had a tourniquet and you put it in your, uh, in your cargo pants and it was your tourniquet. It was used for your body, not someone else's. Um, and so Eric goes down, I pull his tourniquet out of his cargo pants and we use it on him. And <clears throat> so you can imagine you get into situations where you're in a firefight and you're, you're in the middle of nowhere. And we had cases of eight hours or 10 hours where our boys and girls had tourniquets applied by uh, an untrained individual and uh, they just left those tourniquets on. Eight, eight to 10 hours later, they were treated by medics. They had exactly zero cases uh, where, uh, where the lack of oxygenated blood caused uh, dead tissue. 
And so tourniquets, tourniquets, tourniquets are your answer uh, for a lot of your questions. It's just stopping that bleeding. So that's one of the things that I'm going to throw in there as a kind of a must have. Uh, another, since we're really talking about, uh, we're talking about um, 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 arrows or uh, firearms, uh, vent vented chest seals. Um, if you have um, a lung perforation, a uh, pretty good chance you're going to have a through and through enter your chest, out your back or vice versa. Um, and for, I think what's an obvious reason, the individual who's been hit in the lung and has uh, two holes in the chest uh, through the lungs is going to have a very difficult time breathing. And um, so they, they find that if you, you clean um, that area off as best you can, you slap um, a, a vented chest seal and they come in pairs for, I think, obvious reasons. You slap one on the front, one on the back, and you're allowing the individual um, to breathe uh, a lot easier. And so I think those are important in, in the fact that we're, we're working with, uh, we're working with firearms and, and bows and arrows. And then my final thing that I want to throw, uh, is something we've talked about is the quick clot, uh, sponge. Um, it is, um, it's a great, uh, chemical wonder. It technically, technically does, uh, it breaks down and has an expiration, but I think, um, it's like one of those things, um, uh, that like, uh, my wife, uh, the nurse um, uh, of 30 years says, you know, yeah, give me all your expired aspirin because it's expired and doesn't work anymore. I'm, I'm happy to use it. I get it to someone who does. Um, these are one of those things that is going to use um, uh, uh, chemistry to help solve a lot of your problems. Um, and so if you've got some, um, some wound, multiple wounds, this is going to help slow things down in one area where you're working on another area. So that's my, uh, my three would be the tourniquet, the vented chest seals and the, and the, um, the quick clot. Excellent. So a question came in guys on tourniquets and the question was, can it kill a limb? Yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of what we talked about. That's kind of yeah. the, the old school thought process. Uh, if, if you, our guys and gals, sadly, we, we had thousands and thousands of case studies that were reviewed uh, by our guys and gals in Afghanistan and, and Iraq, and they had exactly zero cases of um, not non-oxygenated blood, um, not getting to where it needed to go and a limb dying. Um, it, it, it's, it's an old school thought process yeah. that, um, that, um, used to be taught and it's not the case anymore. Excellent. Thanks for answering that. So Rick, I think you had a few things you were going to add to this. Yeah. Do we also had a question came in why baby aspirin? And the reason is baby aspirin can be used in the field. If you suspect that somebody's having a cardiac issue, it helps thin the blood prevents blood clots. And so that's why baby aspirin is used. Excellent. Um, so yeah, obviously I, I said uh, two of my favorites already. One is the SteriPen because um, the majority of us throughout our lives here in the United States do not drink enough water. Um, and flat out, we operated be at a dehydrated level. And there's a great study that came out of USC about 10 years ago they went to a, a inner city school in the LA school district where they had the same teacher and curriculum for third and fourth grade. They didn't do anything third grade and the average score of grades for kids were C minuses to Ds. The next year, same teacher, same curriculum, but the um, people from the School of Medicine made sure the kids drank four bottles of water during the day. Okay. At the end of the year, the grades were A minuses and B pluses. Why? Because when you're dehydrated, you're just not able to think as clearly. And so I'm very big on in those situations, making sure you have clean water that you feel confident to use. And that's why I always recommend a SteriPen because the vast majority of accidents in the wilderness start with when you peel it all the way back, the people were dehydrated, they weren't paying attention, the accident happens, and then things just start to cascade in a downward motion. So I'm all about preventing that from happening. One of the best ways is simply drink enough water. Um, you know, yeah, just on that note, Rick, what's enough water? Is, how much do you think you should be drinking? Like if you're actively hunting? 
Yeah, so actively hunting, um, and this is a weight issue too, because I mean, yeah. you are either going to be carrying roughly about a gallon and a half to two gallons, which is anywhere from 12 to 16 pounds, or you're going to be plotting of how you're going to get water to, to refill, and that's where the steri pen comes in. So, yeah. and, and sometimes you're in a place where you can do that, and sometimes you're not. And so, that's one of those considerations you have to have. But hunting, yeah. you burn up more calories. People need to realize four hours of hunting burns up more calories than someone running a marathon. And mm. so people don't think about it that way, but you know, you're moving, you're doing a lot of things all at once. Um, from there, I would say, you know, steri strips are definitely one of my things. Um, as Mike knows, when you're on the field and as a medic, both in the military and in and the civilian world and wilderness, um, steri strips are amazing. You can pull skin together, you can do a lot of things. Um, I've used them to to tape bandages together when the bandages weren't holding up. I mean, there there's lots of uses for steri strips. So I actually carry about twice what my cat in the kit, but that's that's a personal thing for me. And then um, the other thing that we didn't have in here, we talked about a lot of stuff, but I would also say, you know, in the in a field in a high end situation, a lot of things are going to happen when there's an accident, and having a small like a you know, space pen, uh, I'm trying to get that. Hate that, space pen and like a pad that you can write on. That is really important because at some point you're going to be mm -hmm. talking to people about help and more information you can give, but you're not going to remember when you did things. And so I tell people take breaks as you're going through this and, and write down that information because then when you do get to help, you can give that information that can make a big difference in the treatment plan for that person. Right. Let me um, give you a fun, uh, this isn't an in the kit item, but this is a fun thing. This would be something for a head wound that I couldn't exactly use, but uh, Rick might be able to, um, it, uh, where a, a steri strip would be more useful for me uh, in that if you have, uh, if you have nothing at your disposal um, and you have a gash in your head, you can take hair, especially the longer the hair, the better. You can take hair and uh, take one, you get that slit here, you take hair on this side, hair on that side, bring it together, tie it, tie it tight, and just keep doing that along the side of the incision. I think that, that they could do that with Rick, but I think I need more stuff <laughs> in my head. <laughs> awesome. Um, a couple of questions, guys, that are coming in. Uh, I think this would apply to you, Mike, about Poison ivy toxin wipes are they? Do they work also on poison oak? Yeah, you're. It's it's basically you're looking at something that's going to break up the oils. Is okay. really is really what you're doing. It's um, they're not. They're, please don't think of them as a cure all. They're not great. They're not perfect. It is. A, it's a. It is a. Yeah. It will improve your situation for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And then we had a suggestion from a hunter ed instructor about. Carrying paracord and crazy glue in a trauma kit. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, crazy glue is another good option for uh, closing up wounds. Uh, alternative to using hair or steri strips. Um, the cr crazy glue, that standard old crazy glue, is roughly the same stuff as medical glue, just about uh, a tenth of the price. And if you were to, if you've got a, a cut on the head and you apply crazy glue and then you push it together and hold it in place, uh, that is gonna be another great way to stop bleeding as well. Excellent. All right. Um, how about you, Rick? How, do you have experiences in the field where having a med kit or having maybe a hunter or a hiker that has a med kit has been able to actually save someone's life or really help them. Yeah, we've had, we've had a couple, we had um, up off the 10 mile road in Sequoia national park. It was an early snow that came through in a uh, first part of October. And there was a hunter that was going through there. He was just scouting. He'd been in the area. Sequoia has places where you can and can't hunt. And uh, he yeah. was coming through and 
came across a couple people that they had gotten dehydrated because they thought they didn't need that much water. Yeah. And then it got cold. And then they're, um, they got themselves stuck in a bad situation. He was able to use the stuff in his medical kit along with his hunting backpack to provide warmth, get information so we could get in there and do the rest of the work that, that saved our lives. And arguably, had he not been there, we would have been recovering bodies, not saving people. Interesting. How about you, Mike? Do you have any firsthand experiences with this or a medical kit that some hunter or maybe a hiker has had that's been really useful? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll give you two two quick ones. Uh, one was um, uh, a gentleman fell and uh, fell onto a hiking pole and uh, went through the backside of his bicep and, and uh, out the front side. And um, so it was uh, probably a third the way through here and two thirds away sticking out there. Um, and we were with folks that said, well, let's just go ahead and let's pull that out. Come on, let's pull that out. Everyone, let's pull that out. And, uh, uh, and I convinced them uh, that we just weren't going to do that. <clears throat> and the, um, uh, the best thing that we, we actually came up with, which probably in retrospect, probably not the best idea is we actually came across some bolt cutters and left about four inches sticking out this way, cut it off, left about four inches sticking out that way and cut it off and then uh, used a cross um, uh, 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 like an H bandage type concept where you're uh, um, coming across and you're binding everything together and as applying, applying as much pressure on both sides as possible to, to, to reduce the bleeding and, um, and then uh, used the quick clot to put in and around both sides and then uh, just got him to walk it, walk it out uh, on his, on his own to about an hour and a half to where he needed to get to the car and then um, uh, next, that was a that was a fall. Next fall, he was back out hunting. Um, wow! And then uh, another one that we've seen uh, a lot of along the lines of what Rick was talking about, <clears throat> mostly hydration issues. Uh, my wife and I uh, lived in uh, Arizona for about a year, and uh, we were training for marathons at the time. And and if you're familiar with Phoenix area. Um, they've got seven um, hikeable summits in the downtown area. Big, huge much metropolitan area, right? You, you can you can envision why you know you live in the, you're, you're in downtown Phoenix. Why would you need hydration uh, 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 supplies? And man, I can't I can't tell you the not, I'm not. We're not even talking about Phoenix in July and August. We're talking about Phoenix in like May, um, where you're getting days that are, are you know like nine percent humidity. And people are going hiking up a mountain and uh, we just, every time we'd go hike up one of those mountains or go run up one of those mountains, we'd uh, see a helicopter going over to the next one because someone's getting life flighted out because they uh, had dehydration sickness and uh, just because they didn't think about the concept, oh, I'll just bring a bottle of water as I'm hiking this mountain in 9% humidity and I'll, I'll just be fine. Um, so we came across a lot of that. And so my, my wife, uh, who's a 30 year, uh, RN with a master's in public health carries her, her backpack everywhere. And when we go hiking with, uh, that's always on her. And so, um, I, I don't think we hiked any one of those mountains when she didn't help at least one person. Wow. wow. Amazing. So I've got a question. So what if you have you don't want to build your own med kit and you want to just buy it. Any suggestions for that? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of different companies. I know Mike and I, um, both the company, the companies we'll tell you about, I think are all really, really reputable. I always tell people really think where you're going to go. And, you know, just like I tell people in the firearms industry, you don't have one firearm to do everything. Obviously firearms are like tools, you have multiple different ones depending on what you're hunting and for target shooting, you know, home defense, et cetera. I'm the same way about first aid kits. I actually have three using um, Mike Steele large kits. I have one that is strictly for hunting. And then I have one that is for when I'm on the water. I, I love to go um, on three or four day canoe or rafting trips. And so that bag and everything is designed differently because it's going to be around water. Water is an issue with a 
a bag. So, you know, I've got it for that. And then um, I built one for my son and then said, I'll never do that again because he does mountain climbing. And I was able to buy one from Adventure Medical that's designed specifically for mountain climbing. And I was like, it was cheaper and uh, really, really efficient. And so about the only thing he did was rearrange. And that's the big thing I would say too, is on any of these bags, I'll go back to that. Feel confident to rearrange it. I mean, I, I saw Mike Snicker earlier when I said this, but you know, you take everything out and you decide, well, where would I want that? What do I think I'm going to be doing? And you put those things up front and the things you think you're least likely to do, you put them in the back, but you get familiar where they're at because you know, if Mike's hurt, he wants to see me bringing stuff out to help him in this bad situation. But he doesn't want to see me looking for a manual, tossing things over my shoulder. Yeah, <laughs> that's not going to bode well. Um, and so I'm very, very firm on make sure you you take it out. And it's it's muscle memory, folks. I mean, I tell people your kit is good for about um, 12 to 18 months, and then, you know, a lot of sticky stuff in the kit and things start to go bad, don't throw it away. Take it, go buy a new one and, you know, build your new one and then take that stuff that was in the old kit and have a night where you practice with your family, your friends, your hunting partners, and put that stuff to you. So they're like, oh, and, you know, I've had a couple people, Eric, look at me and go, these Band-Aids aren't working. And I use that as a teachable moment to say, and this is why you don't buy a kit and are still carrying the same kit 10 years later because it's mm -hmm. going to be useless. Yeah. And Rick, what, what was the name of that company that uh, that you would recommend for buying packs? Adventure Medical Good. was one of them. Yeah. Good. Um, for me, um, this, uh, my IFAC, the individual first aid kit uh, that we use is um, from Mountain Man Medical. Um, there's a couple of things about Mountain Man Medical that we really dig and um, one of the things they are not is, um, they're not the cheapest around. Uh, you will not, uh, you will not say, well, let me go find a budget, uh, kit on mountain man medical. And here's the big thing. A good example is if you're going to get a tourniquet, you're going to, you're going to right now, you're going to spend 35 bucks on a good tourniquet. You can also find them for six or $7 on Amazon. Please don't buy those because they've got plastic junky windlasses on them and they're going to snap when you need them the most. Right. So um, what mountain man medical does is number one, they'll allow you to um, piece together a kit. You can start with a base kit and say, Oh, take this out, add this uh, and, and they can alter it. Um, but here's the big thing that we love about mountain man medical. Number one is that there is that they are um, quality, quality stuff. Best of the best uh, is why they're not going to be the cheapest. Um, and then number two is their, their guarantee is just outstanding. If you use anything from mountain man medical kits to, um, apply in a trauma situation, they will replace that, those items for free. And, uh, I, I'm, we don't have stock in mountain man medical. We don't make a dime for, for talking about this, but the idea that they'll stand by this, um, and basically say, if you, you pull two tourniquets out of here and some quick clot and some stereo strips and you use them to, to save Eric's life. Sorry, Eric, you're the one that seems to be getting hurt. All, 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 <laughs> all right. um, you use those things on Eric, you get a hold of Mountain Man Medical and they, they'll replace all that stuff for free. So that's one of the things we love about, about them as far as quality. Excellent. Thanks guys. We had a question that came in about incorporating sanitary sanitary napkins and tampons to help with bleeding. What are your thoughts on that? Is that necessary? Personally, I don't think it's necessary, but it's one of those items that if it's in your, especially like in your, your vehicle, that's not, it's something to note and know that it's there. Or if you have a co-ed team that's going out there and somebody has it, that is a backup. If you end up in a very bad situation, it's a good thing to have. And and to know how to use. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not something I would put in my kit as a primary. It's so, it's something that if I'm just out of luck and I got no real yeah. good options, um, sure, I'll, I'll use anything. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like since you brought the baby issue up, it's like I I would tell some of my medics, 
newspapers are not what you primarily want to use when delivering the kid, but a brand new newspaper is extremely sanitary. And so mm -hmm. it's a good alternative to have there. So, you know, I'm not telling you to carry newspaper around inside your med kit to deliver a baby, yeah. but if you have it, it's a good resource. Excellent. Yeah, let's, let's get rid of our sterile uh, 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 gloves and uh, throw in a whole bunch of newspaper. We'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. All right, guys. Do you have anything else you want to add? Any any other information? But yeah, I did see one in one of the questions, and that was um, the duct tape issue. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, duct tape is legendary for lots of reasons. It can be used, but again, I wouldn't consider it a primary thing to have in your medical thing. I do think it's something you want to have in your backpack that when you're going out for a few days because it's got multiple uses. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's not something I'm going to put in my kit as a primary. It's it's another really great backup option when I'm just out of luck. Um, I, I I would I would really throw this in as well is um, do something uh, because yeah. doing something is much much better than doing nothing, and you may not definitely go get training on on your kit and your gear and how to use it get training on first aid medicine get training on on uh on backwoods medicine um get training on, yeah do all that well what if i forget the ratio uh of of beats to, uh, of breaths to uh to compressions in my cpr yeah just do something well, yeah. What if I don't push hard enough on, on the wound to stop the bleed? Yeah, just do something. Right. Whatever you do is better than the current situation you or they are in right now. Mm -hmm. So just do something for yourself or those that you're trying to, to serve. And it's a lot better than just letting them bleed out or letting them suffer. Absolutely. I love that motto. And I want to thank you guys both for coming on tonight. Thanks for serving this way. Um, and before we close, I just want to kind of give a shameless plug uh, for some adv advanced hunter education stuff that we've got in the works. We've got 25 in-person clinics and webinars lined out for 2024. And we've got more in the works. Um, I put the registration link for advanced hunter education in the chat. And we've got some really cool stuff planned. Um, we're going to be doing webinars on bighorn sheep, elk, pronghorn hunting. We're going to be doing a webinar on hunting with kids. And then we've also got a bunch of in-person clinics planned. Uh, we've got a big game backcountry hunting clinic, long range rifle hunting clinics. We've got beginner and advanced archery clinics. And then we've got a bunch of traditional clinics planned like deer hunting, turkey hunting. So if you can tell, I've been really enjoying my job and I'm super thankful for it. I'm thankful for people tuning into these webinars. And so sign up for some clinics and I wanna just say Merry Christmas to everyone and uh, get out there and hunt this next coming year. Talk to you later. See you guys, thanks Mike. Thanks Rick. <laughs>